Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we're going to look at a path to resolving the paradoxes of quantum physics. My guest is Dr. Bernardo Kastrup, who has often been a guest on the New Thinking Aloud channel. He is a computer scientist and a philosopher, and he has co-published articles with major figures in the field of physics on quantum physics. He is the author of many books, including Rationalist Spirituality, an Exploration of the Meaning of Life and Existence Informed by Logic and Science. Meaning in Absurdity, What Bizarre Phenomena Can Tell Us About the Nature of Reality. Dreamed Up Reality, Diving into the Mind to Uncover the Astonishing Hidden Tale of Nature. Why Materialism is Baloney, How True Skeptics Know There is No Death and Fathom Answers to Life, the Universe, and Everything. Brief Peaks Beyond, Critical Essays on Metaphysics, Neuroscience, Free Will, Skepticism, and Culture. More Than Allegory on Religious Myth, Truth, and Belief. The Idea of the World, a Multidisciplinary Argument for the Mental Nature of Reality, and of course, Decoding Schopenhauer's Metaphysics, and it's really upon that book that our discussion shall be based today. This is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Bernardo. It's a pleasure to see you once again. Nice to see you again, Jeff. Always a pleasure. It's very interesting that uh, you've written this elegant chapter in your book on Schopenhauer about quantum mechanics, but I suppose it's important to specify for the benefit of our viewers, you are credentialed as a philosopher and a computer scientist, not a quantum physicist. That's correct. I've worked in a physics environment for years, but I don't have a physics degree. And you've co-authored uh, at least one paper if, on uh, quantum physics with some very esteemed physicists. Yes, I know the one you're referring to with Henry Stopp and uh, Menas Kafatos on Scientific American. I did author a few others uh, on quantum mechanics as well. I trust that you know what you're talking about. Uh, so we can uh, start digging into it and, and really in some detail. And I think the issue goes back to Einstein and the EPR paradox in, in which Einstein thought he could refute quantum physics by pointing out a strange effect that he said, if quantum physics is true, that means spooky action at a distance. And uh, since spooky action at a distance would be impossible to anybody with a naturalistic perspective, therefore, Einstein felt that quantum physics wasn't really true. Right. That's a famous 1935 uh, paper, uh, first authored by Einstein and a couple of others as well. And uh, he has been proven wrong. By a whole series of uh, experiments that I remember back when I was a graduate student in at Berkeley back in the 1970s, a physicist there, John Clauser, did some of the, the very first tests of, of what became more formalized from the, what was we call it the EPR paradox, Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky paradox became formalized by uh, John Bell. He, John Bell, he basically, um, because you see, the thing is, um, the EPR paradox is about two entangled particles behaving in a way that cannot be described independent of the other. So they behave as as though they were still. Uh, intrinsically connected, even though they are measured at large distances. Um, and 
one possibility would be to say that, uh, hey, um, they are behaving in an in a interrelated way because they have some unknown property that they share. They share from the moment of their creation, which leads to, the, to these correlations in their respective behavior. And it just appears that they are still connected, but they are not. They only have this hidden shared property. And uh, John Bell, what he showed is that um, there are experiments you can do to differentiate the predictions of quantum mechanics from the predictions that a theory based on this shared local hidden property uh, would make. So you can make a distinction between the two. And this distinction has been formalized by John Bell in that uh, theorem, Bell's theorem of Bell's inequalities, and they have been experimentally shown to be the case. In other words, you cannot explain the, the entanglement of particles in, in quantum mechanics on the basis uh, either of, well, you cannot uh, um, make sense of that in the way that Einstein thought we would need to make sense of it by, by hidden local properties, hidden local variables. I remember back in 1975 when I published my first book, The Roots of Consciousness, I worked with a physicist then, Jack Sarfati, who knew about Bell's theorem and uh, I think my book was actually the first popular exposition of how it might in some way be related to parapsychology. And the thinking back in those days was that, uh, th that there was a signal that could transfer faster than the speed of light because of uh, this strange entanglement. Uh, now, I think most physicists today don't accept that interpretation. Your interpretation actually is much more daring. Signal transmission faster than the speed of light would violate uh, relativity, which is where Einstein was coming from. So I don't think that is taken very seriously today as a hypothesis to make sense of quantum entanglement or Bell's inequalities. In the meantime, there are some more inequalities published in 2003 by another physicist. It doesn't matter. Um, so we, we are left with, well, th there aren't many options we are left with. One is to say, the, the, the entangled particles still share a property, but that property is not local. It's not in the particles themselves. It's sort of smeared out across space and time. Uh, that's uh, so the, the so-called global hidden variables uh, interpretations. Uh, but there are new inequalities proven and published in 2003, but proven mathematically, um, Leggett's inequalities by physicist Tony Leggett. Um, and some of those inequalities, unlike Bell's, made a distinction between uh, what we call uh, realism and locality, because Bell's inequalities prove that the quantum system violates either uh, realism, that the particles exist in and, in and of themselves, or it violates lo locality. And uh, the global uh, interpretations would say, well, they violate locality because there is a global property and it's smeared out across space and time. But Leggett's inequalities make a distinction. There are some inequalities by Tony Leggett that, 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 that are only about realism. And those have been proven as well, uh, which leads to the conclusion that, you know, you cannot speak of the particles existing in and of them, themselves before they are observed. It's, it is the act of observation that brings their physical reality into being. And uh, therefore, my own daring interpretation is that before they are observed, they don't exist physically. They exist as a mental state, a transpersonal mental state out there, which essentially constitutes what we call the shared world. And it is by interacting with this transpersonal uh, mental context uh, that we bring physicality about uh, on the screen of our perception. So for me, physicality can be reduced to transpersonal mentality. And I think quantum physics uh, has come to a point where this conclusion is very, very nearly inevitable uh, to anybody uh, contemplating the latest results without prejudice. Well, I suppose without prejudice is, is the key <laughs> phrase in your sentence there, because uh, there's a very strong prejudice amongst physicists towards materialistic, physicalistic explanations. Uh, I, I talked to one scholar who said that the, the many worlds theory of Hugh Everett is gaining in popularity because people in the physics community would rather not acknowledge uh, the significance of consciousness. 
unfortunately, but th th that is built into the, the, the culture of physics, into the history of physics. Uh, physics started as a reaction to, to religion, uh, to, to the way religion had of making sense of, of nature. Um, so it reacted to that, um, and it has it built into its DNA, you know, to go away from the idea that there is a mind underlying nature, uh, and instead thinking of nature as a mechanism. Um, I think, you know, as a reaction to the status quo back in the 17th century, this was legitimate, because when things are so extreme, you need to counter that by playing on the other extreme. But the pendulum has now swung all the way to the other side. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, experiment is uh, the, the, the final criterion for, for, for truth in physics. And what the experiments are telling us uh, defy uh, the autonomous objective existence of physicality. And then some people prefer to think of nature as a mushrooming infinity of parallel universes for which there is not a smidgen of empirical evidence, they prefer that than to think that a ontological category we know to exist, mentality, because we have it, to, to, to think of this category as existing beyond the boundaries of living beings in the form of a still very naturalistic but transpersonal mental context uh, surrounding us. For some reason, Although these two hypotheses are, are, are hardly comparable in plausibility, you know, to think of uh, infinities being created at every infinitesimal moment of time, infinities of new multiverses, uh, new universes, uh, and, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, imagining a transpersonal mind, they think the infinity of, <laughs> of universes is more plausible. And, and that's, if anything is a cultural artifact, that is one right there. Well, you referred to a, a series of experiments that are attempting to, to kind of pin this down. And I, I re, uh, remember John Clauser at Berkeley did some of the very earliest tests of Bell's theorem, uh, in the 1970s, uh, used to hang out with him, uh, in those days. But, uh, these tests are continuing, and I'm under the impression that there are still physicists who believe we could use, there, there, we'll find a way to use, uh, Bell's inequality to actually transmit signals, uh, faster than the speed of light. They haven't given up on that. That, that is a, a theoretical impossibility. There is a theorem in quantum information theory, the no communication theorem, which shows, uh, uh, um, without any shadow of a doubt, theoretically, um, and the theory has been confirmed in many other different ways, that you cannot use quantum entanglements to transfer information. You only know that the measurements made in different points of the universe correlate once an observer brings them together. Uh, but they cannot be used to transmit information faster than the speed of light. It is not possible. Since I know you have a, um, a book that will be coming out uh, next year on uh, the metaphysics of Carl Jung, who wrote extensively about synchronicity, let me bounce this off of you. I did speak with a physicist and parapsychologist from Germany, Walter von Lukadu, who maintains that uh, this uh, quantum entanglement actually is quite compatible with Jungian synchronicity. I agree, it is, but that does not mean that you can transmit information faster than the speed of light. And the reason is, look, if Bob is doing a, a, a measurement on one side of the universe, and, me and Alice is doing a measurement on the other side of the universe, and the measurements are entangled, you could, you could suspect, uh, you could at least think that they could use this entanglement to transmit information to one another faster than the speed of light because their measurements are correlated, so you could use this correlation. But actually you can't because you only know that they are correlated once uh, uh, Alice and Bob come together and they have to come together according to the limits of the speed of light. You know, they have to walk towards one another or take a bus, whatever. Uh, and then they can compare notes and only then do they see that what they measured was highly correlated. Uh, that Alice's measurements were highly correlated with Bob's measurements. Before they come together, they only see their own measurements, and their own measurements are random. Uh, it, taken in and of themselves, the measurements obey uh, uh, the criteria for randomness. So they cannot transmit information to one another faster than the speed of light. 
because the phenomena in question is only real, is, is only noticeable once they come together. But, but synchronicity, uh, uh, Jeff, synchronicity is a different thing. Synchronicity is not saying that we can transmit information faster than the speed of light. It's only saying that events that do not obey local causal relationship, in, in other words, events that uh, happen without a causal link between them, that they can still be correlated despite the absence of this causal link. Um, and for those events, we, we, we would normally use the word coincidence. Things that happen together but are not causally related, we say, well, it's a coincidence of two events. Uh, and what Jung said is these coincidences are meaningful. In other words, they are not random. Uh, uh, they review uh, patterns of correlation in the physical world. Uh, and that is entirely consistent with entanglement, but without the need for uh, faster than light information transfer. One of the points I think you're making that if two particles are correlated uh, at the opposite end of the universe, theoretically speaking, it suggests that uh, in a very real sense, the universe is an undivided whole. Yes, yes, that, that, that is largely acknowledged, I think, um, that, uh, you know, if everything ultimately is a quantum system, then no single part of the universe can be described independently of the rest of the universe. It, uh, ultimately, the universe must be an entangled uh, whole. And what we consider to be um, um, local causality, like uh, if, uh, if I hit a ball on a snooker table and the ball hits another ball, you know, there is a chain of local cause and interactions there. That is an emergent phenomenon. It, 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 is, it is an appearance, appearance of a deeper reality of uh, entanglement. And how exactly that appearance emerges from the quantum uh, substrate that ultimately is the only real reality, uh, it is an open question. We, we do not know yet. I've had people explain it this way to me, that if you look at the universe at a, at a quantum level, like take an atom, an atom is mostly vacuum, like the solar system itself, the particles within the atom are very, very far apart. It's, it's practically all vacuum, and yet in our macro world, things seem solid, but that's really an artifact of, of our perceptual apparatus. Absolutely. And our notion of solidity, of concreteness, these are all um, yeah, artifacts of our perceptual apparatus. Uh, uh, we do not know what governs this transition from quantum reality to classical appearance, uh, but we do know with a very high degree of confidence that regardless of how this transition happens, at bottom, reality is quantum. And therefore, uh, it is, uh, there, is, there is unit at the bottom of reality. Now, we've talked uh, briefly in our previous interview on Schopenhauer's metaphysics about how uh, the findings of quantum mechanics, which uh, have been earned uh, through very careful experiments over a hundred years now, are really quite consistent with the metaphysical insights that Schopenhauer arrived at, uh, what, nearly 200 years ago. Yeah, yeah, a little over, <laughs> a little over 200 years now, 202 years. Um, I would say, I would put it in slightly different. I would say Schopenhauer's insights could have, could can still make sense of the apparent paradoxes of quantum mechanics. And if we had heeded those insights earlier, we wouldn't be talking about paradoxes of quantum mechanics today. And the reason being that the paradoxes arise from this uh, assumption that uh, all reality is physical. Um, but if you look at uh, what physics is, physics is the science of perception. It uh, models uh, 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 and predicts uh, the behavior of what is on the screen of perception, the things you can see, smell, touch. Uh, physics doesn't predict your next feeling. Physics doesn't predict your next thought. It, it, it predicts how things will appear to perception. And then we discovered that it is very handy to, to model these perceptions according to mathematical equations. It allows us to make predictions and develop technology. And then ultimately we replace that which is described, perceptions, with the description, 
we say that perceptions are epiphenomenal. The qualities of experience are created by the brain. And what is out there is purely quantitative. It's mass, charge, momentum, geometrical relationships. So we replace the original thing, the qualities of the world around us with a description. And then because of the experiments with quantum mechanics and entanglement and, and, and all that, uh, we fall into contradiction. If the world really were only that description, if there, were, if there were nothing more to be said about the world other than what is captured in physical descriptions, um, we face uh, uh, contradictions, we face dilemmas. For instance, quantum mechanics tells us that there is no physicality out there until a measurement. Yeah, but a measurement presumably is performed by something physical. But if that something physical doesn't exist until it's measured, yeah, then, then there is nothing to measure it. And then there should be nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we go nuts because of this underlying assumption that only the physical exists. And what Schopenhauer told us was that, uh, you know, the physical is what Schopenhauer calls representation. It's how things appear on the screen of perception. But behind the representations, underlying the representations as the essence that leads to representations, uh, there is the will. And the will is not something on the screen of perception. It's defined as that which is not perception. It is defined as endogenous mental states like desire, fear, comfort, discomfort. So for Schopenhauer, nature ultimately is will. And, and representation or perception is just how the wheel appears to observation. Now, if you bring that into quantum mechanics, the paradoxes disappear. Uh, 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 representations are a, 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 an outcome of measurement. In other words, the f physicality is an outcome of measurement. But before measurement is done, there is still something which is not physical. These are endogenous transpersonal mental states. And uh, uh, upon observation, these transpersonal mental states present themselves to us in the form of measurable physical things displayed on the screen of perception. That is the, the, the key thing about Schopenhauer's uh, philosophy that would, you know, make sense of all the reigning confusion about quantum mechanics. What you're saying is that the, the science that we call physics is really a science of consciousness. It's a science of a particular type of contents of consciousness, namely perception. But perception are not the only things we experience. I mean, I can close my eyes or go into a perfect, ideal sensory deprivation chamber, and then I will see nothing here, see nothing, hear nothing, smell nothing, sense nothing through my skin. Uh, but I will still experience, I will still experience my, my neurosis, my thoughts, my desires. Uh, 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 th there are endogenous experiential states that are not perceptual. In formal uh, uh, philosophy uh, terminology, we would say there are experiential states that have no intentional content, that have no aboutness. They are not about something out there. They are pure inner states. Uh, that are experienced from a first-person perspective and, and have no correlate in a second-person perspective. Um, and for Schopenhauer, these endogenous states were will. And if you were to observe the will from a certain point of view, then the will would present itself to you as perception or as representation, as he called it. So in Schopenhauer's terminology, we could say physics is the science of representation. And the moment it insists that representations are all there is, it falls into contradiction because physics itself is telling you that there are no representations before measurement or observation. And then the contradiction is, well, but there is nothing else. So, yeah, that's the problem. And Schopenhauer would just say, no, there is the will that underlies every representation. Before measurement, there is only the will. It's not appearing to you in any way because you didn't look at it. Once you look at it, then the will presents itself as physicality, as perception, representation, whatever term. I suppose in theological terms, the, the will might be associated with creation itself. He could have called it endogenous experiential states, a much more neutral term. Um, but he chose the word will. And he chose it for two reasons, uh, I believe, and I argue that in the book. Um, these are not just abstract experiential states. These states entail volition. 
uh, volition in the sense of desire or fear. And it's equally volitional when you reject something, when you feel I don't want that. That's volitional as well, negative volition. So Schopenhauer thought that our endogenous states or the world's endogenous inner states were volitional in nature. And, and he said that because through this, he could explain why things happen at all. If everything, in essence, from, 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 the, from the first person perspective, from the inner side, is will, then that will provides the impetus for things to happen, for events to unfold. Uh, if those endogenous states were not volitional, uh, if they were states of pure contentment, um, then nothing would happen. There would be no impetus for action, for movement, for evolution in nature. Um, that's one reason uh, he called it will. The other reason was to make sure that uh, those states were endogenous. He wanted to capture that in the word, that he's talking about endogenous states, not perceptual or uh, intentional states. Um, intentional in the strict philosophical sense, which has nothing to do with intent. Maybe I shouldn't use these terms because I would confuse people. Um, so from that perspective, um, if the inner essence of the world is volitional, we have an explanation for why things are unfolding. Why did we come from the Big Bang up to the point we are now? Why there are there are dynamic laws of nature? Um, why, why things happen at all? Well, I wonder if I can jump around a little bit and, and maybe ask you some questions outside of uh, the uh, elegant chapter on uh, Schopenhauer and uh, quantum mechanics. We were talking earlier about Einstein and general relativity and, and the speed of light. And I, I'm under the impression, since I'm much less of a physicist than, than you are, uh, that there, there's still a, a an a major problem that hasn't been reconciled, which is that uh, general relativity, uh, an accepted theory, and special relativity, an accepted theory, uh, is doesn't seem to be uh, compatible with quantum physics. No one has figured out yet how how these theories work together. That's right. Um, the, the current state is when we look at very big things like uh, galaxies, galaxy clusters, uh, special relativity applies to a phenomenal degree of precision and accuracy. Um, and when we look at very small things, like subatomic particles, um, things uh, behave exactly according to the predictions of quantum field theory, uh, down to a phenomenal level of precision. Um, but we know that they contradict one another. So somewhere between the very small and the very big, something is happening that we don't understand. Um, and that has been the impetus behind physics going way beyond empiricism in the last couple of decades. Um, because you know, empirically, we only observe the very big or the very small, um, but we know that theoretically, uh, th there is a contradiction and there has to be something new. And that has motivated superstring theory, M theory, multiverse theory, and all that, which in a sense is a kind of mathematical philosophy because it has lost empirical ground. It's a theoret These are theoretical exercises, very valid, but it's questionable whether it's really physics or philosophy, mathematical philosophy. Um, and yeah, it, 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 this a, has this been a good thing or a bad thing? I, I, I don't know, but uh, we do know that there is something we don't understand. Uh, my, I can be more specific. Um, quantum field theory uh, says that, okay, there are different quantum fields and we can explain all microscopic reality by postulating a few different quantum fields. And there are efforts to unify these fields and come to a unified field theory of the very small. And we probably are going to get there. The problem is when you bring, the, when you bring gravity into that, gravity fits nowhere. Uh, and these are the problems of so-called quantum gravity uh, theories. Uh, and this is an unsolved, uh, open problem. Well, do you think uh, metaphysic, the, the metaphysics of Schopenhauer might be in any way helpful uh, with regard to that problem? I don't think so. I think this is an altogether different problem than the seeming contradictions of quantum entanglement. Uh, because you see... The problem of quantum entanglement is purely interpretation. Our prejudices don't match with the experiment. And people are trying to 
find theoretical loopholes to accommodate our prejudices. But this is artificial. This is silly. The experiments are very clear. Nature is not what we think it was uh, with materialist uh, glasses on. So it, it, that is soluble. Um, but the conflict between gravity and the other fundamental fields, it's not a matter of interpretation. It's a matter of prediction. Um, it's an altogether more challenging thing. I think even if we were to abandon materialism at a cultural level, and then I think many of the paradox of quant paradoxes of quantum mechanics would disappear, but the conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics wouldn't. That, uh, that, that needs a solution, a different solution. Because when I think about general relativity uh, from my non-physicist perspective, I, it seems very paradoxical. For example, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, as, as we've already stated. And yet, if I'm traveling at the speed of light, my watch will stop completely. There, there is no time at all. So I could travel from one end of the universe to the other. And uh, from my perspective, it would take no time. Let's illustrate that with the famous paradox of the twin brothers. Uh, there are two twin brothers. One stays on Earth. The other jumps into a spaceship that's traveling close to the speed of light. Uh, um, so when the twin brother that, that went traveling in space returns, lo and behold, he's a lot younger than his sibling who stayed on Earth. Right? Right. Now, from the perspective of the twin who stayed on Earth, let's say 50 years have passed. And he experienced those 50 years as you and I experienced 50 years. From the perspective of the twin who went traveling, five years have passed. But from his perspective, he experienced the, the, the five years like you and I experienced five years. Not, he would be none the wiser about any difference. It's only when he comes back to Earth and meets his twin brother. Ah, now they realize that something very weird has happened. For one of them, they feel, he feels five years have passed, but for the other, he feels 50 years have passed. And physically, that's exactly what happened. For one, five years. For the other, 50 years. But individually, we don't experience anything strange. Now, you describe in, in your chapter on uh, Schopenhauer and quantum mechanics a, a perspective called relational quantum mechanics that uh, seems to suggest we each live in our own universe. Yes. Uh, in our own physical universe. Um, you see, again, the paradoxes arise when we insist that physicality is all there is, because the experiments are telling us this can't be. And everybody throw their hands up, and, oh, how can that be? Um, but if you abandon this and you realize that physicality is an appearance of something else, and that something else is not physical, is mental or experiential, then the paradoxes uh, uh, disappear. So if physicality appears only upon measurement or observation, because physicality is an appearance to begin with, then you as an observer uh, will live in the world that is constructed by virtue of, of your personal observations. I, as a different observer or measurement instrument, will live in another physical world that comes into being by virtue of my personal observations. So according to relational quantum mechanics, physicality is always relational or relative. It's like movement. Movement is always relative to the point of observation. If you're inside the train, the train is not moving. If you're on the platform, the train is moving. moving. So according to, to relational quantum mechanics by Carlo Rovelli, uh, all physical parameters, all physical quantities are relational, just like movement is. And therefore, they are private to you as an observer. But in saying that you have your own physical world and I have my own physical world, I'm not denying that there is a shared world in uh, uh, which we both inhabit. I'm just saying that this shared world is not physical. It is made of transpersonal thoughts. So we do share a world. I mean, we would both describe the same earth, the same sky, the same storms, the same trees, the same cars. So obviously there is something out there that is enveloping both of us within which we are immersed, you and I. Uh, the point is only that this objective uh, uh, context, this objective world we inhabit is not physical. 
It is mental, and physicality arises from observation, and therefore physicality is private. In some experiments, I think the double slit experiment is uh, the classic example that's used. The result of the experiment depends on how the experimenter sets it up, and whether you see particles or waves uh, when you shoot photons uh, through the double slit. Uh, some people suggest that um, consciousness itself uh, plays a role then in terms of whether uh, you're getting particles or or waves. Uh, and therefore, people, especially in the sort of new age metaphysical community, would argue we have a role in creating our own reality. Uh, if we apply that idea to what you've just said, uh, that we share reality, it would suggest that uh, Sort of sociologically, or as a as a group, as a community, uh, human beings together create our own reality. Uh, uh, and, and I don't mean that just uh, perceptually. I mean physically. So, so I, I will say something now that is not necessarily my opinion, but I feel obliged to say this. <laughs> uh, so, so there is clarity about uh, what we think and what is actually implied by theory and experiment. And there may be a difference between these two things. Um, to say that we each inhabit the physical world that arises by virtue of our personal observation doesn't necessarily mean that we have control over that physical world. Uh, other than by interacting with it physically, with our hands. Why? Because the point is, this physical world that is individual uh, arises from a interaction between our personal mentation within and the transpersonal mentation, the state of the world out there. And that state out there is what it is. It doesn't depend on us. And then the question is, in that interaction, who who exerts control, uh, who influences more the result, the result being the physical world? Is it that transpersonal mental environment, uh, the size of a universe, or is it the little individual observer with a mental, uh, with, a, with an individual mental perspective that, uh, that interacts with it? Based on the fact that nature seems to go merrily on regardless of what we think of it, regardless of what we wish, I mean, I would certainly wish to get rid of gravity. I would like to float around, <laughs> but I, I don't get my wish. So I would think that it is the objective transpersonal mental states out there that weigh in much, much more than our own individual contribution to that interaction process that gives rise to our physical world. In other words, the fact that the physical world is individual and private doesn't mean that you can control it by just wishing it uh, to be different. So. The, there is no implication here. Now, could we have a little more control over the physical than materialism would grant? Perhaps, because materialism states that you, know, you have no control. It is zero. It's not only a lot less than what the transpersonal states out there uh, would, would uh, admit. It is precisely zero. Well, I don't know. That perhaps goes too far. I think uh, we live in our own reality, at least at a narrative level. We don't experience really the world as it is. We experience the world as we tell ourselves it is. Uh, and on that narrative level, this is, this is certainly a cultural construct. I mean, take language out of the equation and the world would already be completely different. Uh, um, if, if there is no language and you see a colorful bird, now, Imagine that experience without labeling it bird and associating it with everything you're supposed to know about birds and what they are, how they came about, what they do. Suddenly, it's a magical dance of pixels and, and perceptual stimulus of every sort. It's literally magical. So between uh, uh, our reality being a cultural construct from language and internal narratives and our having zero influence on the physical world by mere mentation, between these two extremes, there may be the answer. I don't know. But I certainly don't think that uh, we can wish the world to be what we want. I think empirically that's certainly not true. 
It doesn't seem to be the case, but there's certainly, you know, from the, the, all the parapsychological research on psychokinesis, for example, the possibility that we have a, uh, what my friend Gene Houston likes to call leaky margins, that there, there's some room for uh, a, a, an influence that can't be accounted for by either of the two hypotheses that you've just expressed. I am sympathetic to that. Well, Bernardo, once again, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. Uh, uh, I could ask you a hundred more questions, I think, uh, but uh, it's hard enough to digest uh, the uh, material that we've already gone through. I think I would begin to uh, overload many of our viewers if if uh, I pursued this further with you now. Uh, I'm very happy to have had this time with you once again. Thank you for being with me. Thanks a lot, Jeff. It was a lot of fun as usual. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.